world has been grappling with the coronavirus for more than half a year. And Singapore too has just passed its six-month mark since the first COVID-19 case was reported here on January 23rd. The battle against the virus continues, but recent findings from human trials of three potential vaccines have yielded positive results. To help us understand how these potential vaccines figure in the global fight against COVID-19, we speak with Dr. Jerome Kim, the Director General of the International Vaccine Institute, who is based in South Korea. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Kim. It's my pleasure. So we'll just get right into it. And like on Monday, results from early stage trials for three vaccine candidates were released and they all showed positive results. So Dr. Kim, can you share with us what are your thoughts on these findings? Would they be a game changer in the global fight against COVID-19? I don't think they're necessarily a game changer. Uh, some of the, We hadn't seen some of the results before, so I think it was encouraging to be able to see uh, Moderna's results, for instance. Uh, but we've had signals already about, um, about the AstraZeneca or Oxford vaccine uh, and about vaccines from China. So I think we were pretty comfortable with um, the data and they were pretty consistent with what we had been led to expect uh, based on review of, of data before they were actually in publication. Um, so not much change there except for Moderna, where you know the, the immune responses, the protective responses induced by vaccine um, really were um, very hopeful in terms of protection. So, I mean, you said the data was kind of corroborate what, what earlier findings had already showed. But in the, in the world's path towards a vaccine, what are the unknowns that need to be solved you know, before you know, we can actually take hope in a vaccine coming soon? Yes, so actually, and, and that's a, a very complicated question. Um, you know, we, we do first have to prove that a vaccine worked. And so now we have at least three candidates that are entering phase three, the final stage of testing, which is very important. Uh, and we may have an answer from those vaccine trials, maybe by the end of this year or early next year. But proving that a vaccine works is only the first step. The second step is actually making enough of that vaccine uh, at high quality uh, and in sufficient quantity to be able to vaccinate people, and then also to have a plan to use it. So how is this vaccine going to get out there? How is it going to be equitably distributed? You know, Singapore is a, is a very small country. Um, how are we going to make sure that we can get Singapore uh, an appropriate allocation of vaccines so that at least the most vulnerable people uh, can be vaccinated? And there are some groups working on that. So we'll come back to the distribution because I think that is something that a lot of people want to know. But in terms of the, the process of making a vaccine, I mean, we have seen a preliminary scientific report on how antibody levels in patients could drop off after a certain period of time after they have recovered. So do you think that would affect the efficacy of a vaccine? Oh, that's actually a great question. So I think that the initial efficacy of the vaccine, so when you give a vaccine, you see the peak of, of protective responses, typically two to four weeks after you give the vaccine. So at least for the short term, a vaccine may show a protective effect. And that's probably what we're going to see over the short term if we look at the, those vaccines that are entering phase three now. What we won't know is exactly the question you asked. How long will that protection last? And, 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 last? and it's a question that we ask for most vaccines. And sometimes we get it wrong. We haven't given the dose exactly correctly so that the protective responses diminish greatly over time. Or we need to boost the amount of vaccine that's present in the dose that you get in order to improve the responses. Or we need to, to give a booster dose, say two years after the initial series. And all those things are typically worked out later um, or will be worked out later in this case um, because we've really compressed the time frame for development uh, to the shortest possible time. It will be possible to look and we will be looking, you know, at, at month six and at month 12 to make sure that those protective responses are present. One of the other things we don't know is you may still have partial protection uh, at month 12, even if we can't detect those protective antibodies. We just, again, we don't have any information on that. So Dr. Kim, I mean, earlier you mentioned that, you know, in this pandemic, um, a lot of research groups are compressing the amount of time taken to roll out or to develop a vaccine. Will that affect the safety of one? So it shouldn't affect the safety per se, um, but it will affect our, um, our long term. So typically when you do a vaccine and say it takes five or 10 years, 
uh, we will have you know, a good amount of time to look at safety over that five to 10 year period. What we're doing now is we're compressing that development phase into one year. So at the best, we will have six to nine months worth of safety information on a relatively small number of people. Um, as So I think when, one of the things we have to do, besides proving that the vaccine works, is begin to collect longer term safety information. So we will have good information up to roughly about six months. We need to commit to follow those volunteers, the people who volunteered to participate in these trials for an extended period of time, so for several years, to make sure that you know, as the protective responses drop off, that these individuals are still protected. The thing that uh, other things that, that could complicate um, uh, infection um, from COVID-19 don't happen to these people who got the vaccine um, earliest. And often we don't know the answers to those questions uh, for other vaccines that come out. And so the Sanofi dengue vaccine, um, we didn't realize that there was something that was going to change the way we prescribe the vaccine until you know three years after the end of the of the trial. So, you know, these are things that happen, and we really do have to commit. Countries need to do it. Researchers like people at IVI need to do it. Companies need to commit to looking at longer term safety to make sure that these vaccines are safe. But in terms of the actual development process, I mean, look, we are looking at phase one, phase two, phase three, uh, phase three trials. So are we, are we saying that um, even though the, this whole process is accelerated, the safety procedures at each step are not compromised? So clinical trials follow a very um, well-described pattern. You know, we do phase one. Phase one is really about safety. And so most of the phase one trials will be complete or at least their data collection initially will be complete uh, by the time um, companies apply for licensure. But these are in very small numbers of people. The phase two trials, which are several hundred people, will also be largely complete by the time you know, companies are applying for licensure. So again, you know, we'll have fairly complete data. What we, and then we'll have the phase three trials, which are you know, thousands. In fact, some people are saying between 30 and 40,000 for COVID vaccine trials. We'll have a lot of safety data on those people, but the trials may not have gone on for long enough. I mean, they, they will go on for long enough to show that there's efficacy. But as we complete those trials, as they go to their very to their final conclusion, we will have a, a good amount of safety data over six to 12 months, which is important. But even beyond that, those people need to be followed uh, for several years. Again, just to make sure that we aren't going to see safety signals that we didn't anticipate uh, when we designed the trial. Okay, and on to the next issue, I mean, that we chatted about earlier, the distribution of a vaccine. I mean, while there have been talks and calls for vaccine multilateralism, we have also seen reports from certain countries about how they want to, to secure vaccines ahead of others. So how, what is IVS, IVI's stance on this issue uh, in terms of the equitable distribution of a vaccine? So those who need, need it most have access to it. So IVI has, was founded on the idea that, that vaccines should be available to all people um, and that you know, global public health is a, is a good thing uh, that we really need to strive to ensure. That being said, you know, vaccine nationalism will occur and the wealthier com countries have secured their own supply of different vaccines. And I think everyone has seen reports of these deals uh, being made. And to be honest, you know, the United States has put you know, $4 billion into Operation Warp Speed in order to get us to a vaccine as quickly as possible. So there will be some element that the countries that are paying to develop these vaccines, the countries that are putting a lot of, um, of their, you know, uh, funding behind vac rapid vaccine development are going to see some preference. I think that the one thing that will help everybody is that there are a group, a large group of countries uh, and organizations like Gavi and the Global uh, which is the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, the World Health Organization, CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, that are really working on a multilateral solution that will guarantee a certain percentage of the, the needed vaccine upfront for all the countries that will sign on to this uh, concept known as the COVAX. And that will allow countries to have enough vaccine to vaccinate the most vulnerable population the elderly, people with underlying conditions, and healthcare workers. And then, you know, that's that kind of mechanism 
that multilateral mechanism hopefully will counteract some of the negative effects that are going to be created inadvertently by vaccine nationals. But what is the role of the pharmaceutical companies in this distribution? So that's a very great question. Um, and, and I think you saw uh, sat the CEO of Sanofi make a statement you know, that, that they were going to provide vaccine to the United States because, of course, they had a contract. Um, and they then had to walk it back a bit. Uh, companies make contracts. Com countries have paid for research and have paid now for you know, an allocation of vaccine, if that's what the, the deals were about. So companies have commitments that are bound, that bind them by contract. I think that the idea behind COVAX is, and CEPI is that organizations that have taken funding from CEPI, which is a group of 15 or so countries, the Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, the European Union, those companies commit to making the vaccine accessible globally and also to selling the vaccine for a reasonable price. And then this access framework that Depi, WHO, and Gavi are working on, again, will hope to secure a certain number of billions of doses of vaccine that can be distributed um, to priority groups for vaccination around the world. So, you know, it's still early days. We still have to wait for this mechanism to be uh, firmly put into place for there to be the kind of agreement that will commit countries and company uh, to providing vaccine that's needed for COVID. So Dr. Kim, I mean, you are Director General of the International Vaccine Institute. Can you share with us what are your earliest estimates for when a vaccine could be possibly made available to tackle COVID-19? So if the current set of vaccines that are now in phase three or soon to be in phase three, um, go forward. And if they're tested and if not, there are no um, unanticipated uh, bad effect, then that set of vaccines may actually have an answer. Does the vaccine work or not? Um, by the end of the year or the beginning of next year. That does not necessarily mean that there will be vaccine available. Now, some countries, the United States in particular, but others as well, um, have secured production of the vaccine before the vaccines actually are proven to work. And that is to ensure that their populations can receive vaccine as soon as the vaccine is shown to be successful in preventing infection and, and is shown to be safe. Not everyone can afford to do that. I see. So do you think a vaccine will actually be a silver bullet in this pandemic? Would this be what helps us all revert to life as we know it? As we used to know it? <laughs> That's, I think, everyone. the question everyone wants to know the answer to. But remember that it's going to take a little while uh, for the world to be vaccinated and it's going to be years. I mean, if you're thinking now that CEPI hopes to have 2 billion doses by the end of 2021, that means that, you know, until the end of 2021, we're going to need to do those things that we're doing now. We're going to need to distance. We're probably going to need to wear masks. We're going to have to be careful when we're in crowds. It's going to be difficult around schools and, and opening of schools. So a lot of the things are not going to revert to the old normal um, all that quickly. So we're going to have to be ready to do what I think we were all planning. There's going to need to be a comprehensive approach to COVID-19 and to vaccination. Vaccination is going to be a powerful new weapon. But will it be a magic bullet that means that at the end of 2021, we can take our masks off and never wear them again? Probably not. Not right away. And we also don't know what vaccine will ultimately succeed. And different vaccines have different characteristics and we'll only begin to understand those when we have the vaccine and we can study it. So thank you, Dr. K, for joining us today and sharing your insights with us on vaccine development globally. You're welcome. Thank you. And that was Dr. Jerome Kim, the Director General of the International Vaccine Institute, who is based in South Korea. For more stories on how Singapore has fared over the past six months, do refer to the Sunday Times special package on this topic in Insight.